Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Peter. Episode 201, recorded for February 22nd, 2023. The Cloud Pod is assimilated and joins the Azure Collective. Which, uh, since the new season of Picard just came out, I felt was a very fitting title. So, well done. Well done, Jonathan. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Sometimes we stare at the, the titles like, these are all terrible and we can't pick one. And then this one, sometimes it just speaks to me. And this was, this is that moment. It's uh, just you and me, though, tonight. Uh, you know, some rowdy kids and, uh, you know, Peter is not a normal name we record. So, he's, uh, he's out. But uh, it's just us. So, hopefully, we can, we can do the due diligence required for all these topics to talk about this week. Yeah, I always love a good Star Trek reference. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. It's a new season. The first episode was good. So if you're in the card, check it out. Uh, announcing the ability to enable AWS Systems Manager by default across all EC2 instances in an account. I guess that's definitely the definition of removing untoiled, or uh, sorry, uh, the toil and uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting for sure. AWS Systems Manager's customers can now have the option to enable Systems Manager and configure permissions for all EC2 instances in an account with a single action using the default Host Management Configuration, or DHMC for short. This feature provides a method to help ensure core System Manager capabilities such as Patch Manager, Session Manager, and Inventory are available to all new and existing instances in an account. Uh, And I thought this was really kind of neat when I saw the headline flash by my RSS feeder. (laughs) But then uh, AWS Steel basically posted on his blog that... uh, this actually isn't so great because uh, by default, it can pass any IAM role to every instance in your account uh, and region, which could be potentially a security hole. So do take a look at this uh, blog post that we link to in the, in the show notes uh, if this is something you want to turn on and make sure you understand fully your responsibility in the shared security model uh, as this could end up in a bad time if you're expecting something else to be happening uh, with your SSM agents. I, I can see how this is really useful because if, you've, if you want to implement Systems Manager for you know, whether it's compliance controls, uninstalling, installing software, people change antivirus vendors all the time, for example. Um, you know, if those machines didn't already have a role to use SSM, it would be particularly difficult, or maybe not difficult, but but a lot of a lot of work required to get that in place before you can start using SSM to remote control the machines. So this is this is super useful. Yeah, I mean, I I, I was in the situation where I'm like, hey, SSM is really amazing, and I want to use it for you know, patch management or for inventory, then you realize you have to go deploy it to all of your servers through some method. And of course, you don't have Systems Manager installed yet, so that makes it sort of hard. <laughs> um, and, you know, you do need the agent, though, to be installed first, so that is probably your first prereq. But uh, yeah, it's yeah. nice to see. Yeah, it's nice to be using the Amazon Linux images. They come with the agent already installed and, and probably running, but without the role, of course, it's, it's fairly useless. Yeah, agreed. Well, if you are in the need of building a telco network, for your new cell phone startup or cell phone network in your factory or whatever you want, uh, Amazon has the new AWS Telco Network Builder Tool. This new service is designed to help communication service providers deploy and manage public and private telco networks on AWS. It uses existing standards, practices, and data formats and makes it easier for CSPs to take advantage of the power, scale, and flexibility of AWS. Today, CSPs often deploy their code to virtual machines, but it also will support EKS, uh, and it meets all, all kinds of lovely standards and concepts and terms. And this article goes into much more depth than I ever cared to know about Telco. Uh, but if you have this as a need, you have a tool. So that's as much as I'm going to say about it. I think uh, pricing for this bad boy is uh, based on API requests. The first uh, 45,000 API requests per month will not be charged in the region. But then after that, there is a extensive TMB pricing page that you can go reference for all of your TMB needs. That's going to change Burning Man for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, they could send one of those connexes we talked about last week, you know, the uh, military grade units into the desert, and then they could hook this up to it for, for cell phone stuff, and off to the races you go. Yep. All right, moving on to GCP. Uh, Forrest Brazil, who's a friend of the show, uh, apparently asked recently, What would you do with $500 in Google Cloud credits? Uh, if you were to leverage the Innovators Plus subscription. For those of you who don't know what the Innovators Plus subscription is because you missed the episode, uh, those unfamiliar with it, the 299-year package gives you $500 in credits plus additional $500 for each additional certificate you get and access to Google Cloud Skills Boost and vouchers for your certification. Uh, and so uh, I have a couple examples that Forrest found of people building things. And so I'm going to tell you what those are, why Jonathan thinks what he's going to spend his $500 credit on. Uh, but uh, so one person said they would uh, build their own Mastodon server on GCP, which you know, Mastodon is definitely popular right now. And 
you know, something that people are trying to do is running away from Twitter as fast as humanly possible. Someone else said, uh, use Vision AI to identify beer preferences and choices, which is, if Ryan was here, that would be, he'd be all about that. <laughs> uh, outdoor activity map tracker app with journaling activities enabled. Uh, they would buy all the domains they ever wanted for the domain name addiction, which uh, is always fun to do. And of course, maybe just build your own skill set with playing with cloud things and uh, leaving them on and spending your $500 overnight on a really expensive instance, which is a great way to spend your $500 credit. So. Many, many options. Uh, I uh, did not really have a great option other than I potentially would build a new Cloud Pod website on the GCP with my $500 from credits. But uh, then I realized it would probably cost more than that and I would need a lot more credits. So based on my architecture. So there you go. What about you, Jonathan? Well, it may have to be Minecraft servers for the kids or... Um, oh, yes, very good. <laughs> or maybe some kind of like cloud storage backup thing for the NAS device or... Uh, oh, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I mean, if it wouldn't cost me as much to move it out of S3 to GCP, <laughs> my NAS backup would be a potentially reasonable option. But uh, yeah, yeah. So those are good reasons. I, I also spin a, like a web proxy up in the UK at this, about this time of year because uh, we like watching the uh, Snooker World Championships and it's mm-hmm. not available on TV here. So I fake, fake my IP address into, uh, into England. And So do you do that with Tailscale? Do you like... Drop a node over that region, put tail scale there, then use it as an exit node for your network. Yep, exactly. Nice. Used to be on AWS, but with five hundred dollars of credits, that would uh, last me quite a while. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the the beauty of tail scale, man, like that thing is amazing. I'm heading to India, and uh, you know that's how I'll be getting to anything I need is through my tail scale network because I have an exit point in my house, and so I can get to all my normal stuff without having to worry about all the India filters and proxies and all that stuff. So, Really. Yeah, it's really useful because I mean I've I've got you know a kid with a with a cell phone and don't necessarily want free access to the internet, so I can require VPN into into uh, a service which I manage, <laughs> <laughs> do web filtering or monitoring that kind of thing. So it's, it's pretty useful. It's also nice when you're when in, you know to have an encrypted link. You know when you're on public networks, you never quite know who's sniffing that traffic. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting actually. I hadn't thought about that use case for the kids, but as they have now moved into the cell phone realm, I've I've got a couple of solutions that I, I'm relatively happy with, but I think are overly expensive. So maybe, maybe you and I need to exchange some notes mm. over, a, over a tasty adult beverage uh, on children, internet safety, <laughs> which is a whole, <laughs> you know, I remember when I was a kid and I got to porn and all those things, you know, that you do as a kid back on dial-up modems. And, but it was, it was still difficult to get to. And the computer was sort of always in a location that was more publicly accessible than you wanted it to be. Uh, but now like it's all it's all hidden in their rooms and on cell phones and they can get to anything and then just go to their friend's house on their Wi-Fi. Like so many problems you have to know risk and like all of a sudden you have a newfound respect for security. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of nice with, with, with MDM and requ- you know requiring the, the use of a VPN. It's it's pretty powerful. Yeah, it can be. All right. Well, Azure has an open source day coming up on Tuesday, March 7th uh, from 9 to 1030. At this virtual event, you can find out the latest in how Azure and Microsoft are driving innovation with open source, which must not be a lot because the event's only 90 minutes. Uh, <laughs> seven reasons that they tell you, say that you should join the event is uh, you can see some amazing app building demos using AKS because that screams open source like nothing else. Uh, learn from Amazon or sorry, Microsoft's partners. Uh, discover new innovation technologies, hear perspectives on open source trends, get proven support for your open source products, learn how to protect your data, and ask the experts on all things open source uh, available to you on Tuesday, March 7th from 9 to 10.30. So luckily it's not too long, so I can squeeze that into my busy schedule. Yeah, it's, it's a little vague. I, you know, like, uh, like some more specific... They, I mean, AKS was not specific enough for you? Mm. Deploy an app on AKS. <laughs> You can learn how to use Kafka on top of AKS. What could go wrong? <laughs> You're brilliant. Uh, well, a subset of this announcement is another announcement they announced that Azure is now on Stack Overflow, or the Azure Collective is technically on Stack Overflow. Uh, the new Azure Collective on Stack Overflow allows users who join the Microsoft Collective to find more than 190,000 questions and other relevant content using over 350 tags, because this doesn't sound hard to discover what you're looking for at all. The Collective is your one-stop shop on Stack Overflow for all things on Azure. As part of the Collective, you'll find quickly uh, find trust answers recommended by recognized members of the Azure community, engage with new content formats, and get in-depth product knowledge that only available to you via the Collective, via articles and bulletins directly from Azure, and build your own Collective reputation by asking or answering questions. 
and become part of the Azure developer community, empowering developers to work better together as part of the collective. I did sign up for the collective earlier, Jonathan. I am now part of the Borg. I am now fully embedded into the collective. And uh, so far, I don't have any questions or answers for anybody. So I'm just sort of lurking right now, but I'll, I'll keep you posted on my journey into the collective. Mm, your uniqueness will be added to our own. It's kind of strange, really. It's a, on one hand, they have ChatGPT and those services, which which they're investing heavily in, which should write this code for you. And on the other hand, they're building a community around answering questions. And that maybe, uh, maybe it just shows their documentation is, is uh, lacking a little. I mean, I sort of feel weird about the fact that official documentation is going to be stored on Stack Overflow. Um, because you would you would seem to think that you'd want that to be on the Microsoft website so you could feel it's a valid and trusted source. Because there's a lot of stuff on Stack Overflow that is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know how I feel particularly about this, but you know, unless they bought Stack Overflow and I missed a memo, uh, it definitely seems like an interesting choice. Maybe that's why. Maybe there's just so much garbage on there that they they thought the best place to put the the accurate documentation was on Stack Overflow. I mean, maybe. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, it's a, that's a weird move. A hundred percent weird move. Uh, but, uh, you know, hey, I, I'm all about community and people trying to find ways to support, uh, you know, their journey to the cloud. So I, I appreciate that there's another option. I just, I find this one a little weird. <laughs> but Yeah, uh, yeah I, su- I suppose recognized members does make it easier to find perhaps more trustworthy yeah. I mean, it's so new that, you know, there's 195,000 questions already here and, you know, like one question has three answers and one vote and 27 views. So, I mean, it's, it's so new, this collective, that, you know, the true value is maybe yet to be found, but uh, I'll keep an eye on it. Uh, Oracle, uh, you know, has now apparently reached the maturity level of all cloud providers where you now have to redesign your console UI. Uh, and their console UI rewrite has a fancy name called a Redwood. The Redwood design is apparently award-winning. I don't know who awarded it, but that's what they said in the press release. Uh, and they do say that right now it's all cosmetic, but eventually we'll have improved interaction designs and usability enhancements that the Redwood design system will provide to you. And if you look at the blog post that we linked to, uh, it's a very... Actually, I I will say, I don't hate this UI, <laughs> which is sort of strange for me. I'd, normally the first one I hate, but uh, you know, having used the console on Oracle... Uh, once uh, or twice. I don't hate this. Yeah, it looks kind of nice. I, I would expect a dark mode from Oracle, though. A very, very dark mode. Very dark. <laughs> Pitch black, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, maybe because it's like this very soothing blue and green color scheme that I just sort of, it doesn't have that Oracle red that I'm used to of like anger and fire and damnation for using our licensing. Uh, it's very, very peaceful. Yeah, so. those, those tiles are very much similar to the AWS redesign as well. Well, I mean, you only copy from the best. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I am glad not to see Oracle Red. So, But it, it is sort of weird to me. It's called a Redwood. Tr- it's a Redwood design system with no red. So, yeah, there you go. It's Oracle. What do you expect? All right. Well, moving on to our Cloud Journey series. And we're starting a new one. Uh, we think this will be about four episodes. Uh, all about migrations and the joy of migrations. Uh, and having done many... Uh, I can tell you that they have, they're all, all fun and games until someone gets hurt. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think we'll talk a couple episodes with this, but, uh, you know, we're going to start out kind of basic here. So apologies for those of you who are like, uh, oh my God, you're really covering this first. So I, we're going to cover what a migration is. And so this is about moving your workload from your on-premise data center and IT closet, wherever your workload runs today, or maybe even a co-location facility and actually moving that workload over to uh, a cloud provider, GCP or AWS or Azure or heaven forbid OCI, uh, or you know the new uh, Akamai Cloud, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. You know all options for you to migrate your workload to. And so there's typically um, a sort of a business driver, which we talked about during your Cloud Center of Excellence series, that will be driving you to think about how you want to migrate to the particular cloud in question. Have you been waiting months and months to hire your new AWS, GCP, or Azure architect only to have them be poached at the 11th hour by a startup with a juice bar? Initiative stalled because you're having trouble hiring? Well, I have a simple solution, Falcon Consulting. Falcon Consulting provides top-notch cloud engineers to the world's most innovative companies and can be burning down your DevOps and cloud backlogs as soon as next week. 
Foghorn certified AWS, GCP and Azure professionals are armed with infrastructure as code and from day one will be designing performant, optimized cloud native or hybrid environments that deliver on the promise of cloud. Their FogOp solution even provides on-demand cloud engineering to augment your existing teams. Visit www.foghornconsulting.com or send an email to cloudtalentnow at foghornconsulting.com and tell them the CloudPods sent you. Your dedicated FogOps team is with you for the long haul, and they bring their own juice. Uh, so there's several methods you can kind of think about. So as you think about a migration journey, you want to start typically in the discovery phase. Uh, and you know, I know I've done quite a bit of discovery, but Jonathan, how do you think about discovery uh, in getting ready for your cloud migration? Um. I mean, I think there's a there's, there's a lot to, there's a lot of um, tribal knowledge, especially around things which have been running a data center for years. Where are the assets stored? <clears throat> um, how do we build it? What are the dependencies? Um, is it even uh, compatible with cloud? You know, do we use multicast, for example? Um, I think there's uh, th- there's a there's a lot to, to understand about your product and the way it works before you can even think about a cloud migration. Yeah. I think the key thing is, is also understanding, you know, what are the subsystems that your application requires? Does it use F5 load balancers? Does it use NetApp storage? Does it use Oracle? Does it use SQL Server? Those are things that you need to kind of inventory as part of the uh, discovery process, which will then allow you to kind of then assess the priority of what needs to be migrated and what order that migration potentially may happen. Because you can't just move this app if it has a bunch of dependencies and things that you don't have in Google Cloud or in, in uh, GCP. Azure or AWS. So you need to think about those type of things and think about plotting out kind of your your application strategy and journey. And you might think about it from a couple different factors in this application strategy. It's like, well, you know, are they sustainable products that you know make a lot of money but don't require a lot of maintenance? Are they new, you know, readily changing applications that are you know having some relative innovation, but they have a pretty healthy customer base? or a pretty healthy user population, or are they really incubator products that need rapid innovation and rapid scale? And when you kind of think about your applications across those three dimensions, you can start thinking about, um, A, is it worth moving it? I don't know that I would move a really sustaining application to the cloud that doesn't need innovation and just looks like for fixed costs and print out money. If it's printing money and it doesn't, it's not, it's working, why mess with it? <laughs> Versus, you know, your traditional uh, incubation startup type application, which is more you know rapid innovation, potentially doing a lot of CI, CD, and DevOps, uh, or a more mature application with lots of user population but still getting a lot of feature development. Those are applications that I would probably prioritize a little bit heavier for migration uh, than others. Yeah, I think one of the things you need to think about is um, people with data centers often have this belief that they have 100% uptime. And when there's not 100% uptime, you know, it's an incident and somebody will take care of it and you, you take that hit on your SLA. Um, but you know, the, the, the assumption is that there, is, there will always be 100% uptime, whereas in the cloud, we're, you know, we're always told to plan for failure. Machines will go down, hardware will need to be going to maintenance, you'll get notifications a week ahead of time that your VM is going to be rebooted, whether you like it or not. And so I think uh, one, of the, one of the important things to think about is how will you handle um, those types of events? You know, is your application stateful? Is it not stateful? Do you need to plan, um, plan how to sort of drain traffic very quickly if, um, if uh, an instance gets, gets terminated, for example? There's, there's lots of considerations, uh, but I think planning for failure is, is probably one of the biggest ones. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a fundamental architecture shift that you have to think about especially as you're thinking about I'm moving into the cloud as you do that mapping of how am I going to connect, you know, these servers? Am I going to have all my availability zones in one, uh, you know, all my servers in one availability zone or am I going to go multi-AZ? Then there's some factors you need to think about from an architectural perspective of some of those. So once you kind of go through, you know, the process of inventorying and assessing, you then you need to decide how am I actually going to move to the cloud? <laughs> and so there's, there's really uh, five popular ways that you can move an application to the cloud, or at least that I've heard most of the time. So the first one is uh, relocate. So this is literally taking my container that's running on-premise or my VMware, con- my VMware image and just vMotioning it, migrating it, moving the container, just relaunching it inside of the cloud. Uh, for those in the containerized workload, that's relatively simple. 
In the VMware environment, you're potentially looking at doing a, uh, you know, setting up ESX or partnering with VMware to build out a VMware cluster inside of the cloud and then doing the motion type technologies between your on-prem world and the cloud. It looks really easy on paper, <laughs> this one, uh, but, you know, there be dragons <laughs> in this. You know, now all of a sudden you're moving your tech debt of VMware potentially to the cloud, which maybe you're trying to get away from and you're going to keep paying that VMware payroll tax uh, for all your assets. or you know, now you still continue to main VMware as part of your op- architecture, et cetera. So that one, that one is easy for containers, easier for containers if you're doing Kubernetes on-prem. Uh, doing Kubernetes on the cloud is easy. But uh, if you're doing the VMware thing, I definitely, you know, that's where the dragons are at. Yeah, I can see why, why, why people may want to use that as a, as a strategy, especially um, when you consider that when you, when you sign a lease for space and data center for power and, power and uh, you know, square footage, it's going to be a three or five year lease probably, and so if, if you if you really want to get out of the data center and you don't want to sign the lease, then maybe you take the hit and and go down the relocation path, but still plan on um, transformation later on. Yeah, I think that's any of these strategies. You know, if you're not replatforming up front or refactoring up front, require that to happen later. <laughs> so yeah. to be fair, <laughs> uh, so the next next one and probably the most popular one that you will hear about from everybody is lift and shift or rehosting. Uh, so lift and shift can be typically either automated or manual. Uh, it can use some automation tools. Typically the cloud providers are offering you some migration tools, which we'll talk about in a future episode um, that'll help you make this transition smooth and seamless. Uh, and this is um, another one that there be dragons, in my opinion. <laughs> There's lots of, uh, lots of things that can happen to you uh, down this path. You know, moving this way will typically result in very high costs because you're typically not taking advantage of cloud native, you're not taking advantage of auto scaling. You may or may not be addressing the availability needs that we talked about earlier. Um, and that can really be a, a detriment to your cloud strategy if your idea is just, I want to move there as fast as possible and then I'm going to replatform after that. Um, just understand that you need to sell that cost problem <laughs> to the business because there's going to be a problem with costs initially. In, in a way, it's very similar to relocate. The only difference in, in this instance is that you're now delegating the 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 um, either the, the container orchestration or the the um, virtualization to the cloud provider at this point, but you're still now just deploying the same old applications, just mm-hmm. on just on new infrastructure. Yep. Uh, the next one is uh, replatforming uh, or lift and reshape, as they call it, and this is really you know typically like hey, I used WordPress on premise in a very on premise way. And now I'm going to the cloud and I'm going to use a WordPress architecture that's more cloud friendly, but still WordPress. So I migrated my data into existing platform type service uh, and potentially that made my migration easy and I got some cloud native benefits. This makes sense for really off the shelf uh, componentry that you're buying uh, that you can, you can have that opportunity. So this isn't all applications. I think it's a very specific set of applications where you're, you know, you can just kind of export your data from one place and import into the other and all is great. And now it's on a cloud native thing. Um, it's an option. Uh, this one is nice if you can do it. It's also maybe where you'd find, um, hey, I have uh, Jira on premise on a server and I'm moving to Jira SaaS. Uh, now that isn't going to cloud, but it's really thinking of the same thing. I'm replatforming to a SaaS vendor at that point versus replatforming to a managed service potentially on, on a cloud. Yeah, I guess it'd be um, somebody moving a, a Java app, for example, to to Beanstalk mm-hmm. or uh, or a PHP app or something like that to to light sail. Yep, very limited use cases. And then the uh, other core, the other close one to that is repurchasing or replace with drop and shop. <laughs> <laughs> so you basically buy a new solution that solves all your problems. So this would be your your classic ERP solution. Like, hey, I had NetSuite, or I had a, a Oracle ERP on-premise and I'm moving to NetSuite because I want a SaaS product uh, or I just want something completely different. So I'm going to purchase a new solution that solves my business need and just happens to be on the cloud or cloud native and so I'm getting that advantage of cloud. And I'm cloudy with no effort, supposedly. That's funny. I never really considered that as being a cloud migration, but it absolutely is. 100% is. Yeah. Yeah. Again, when you think about cloud and the definition of cloud, what is cloud? It's, it's so many things. It's so big. <laughs> um, and then the, uh, the most common one for ISV companies or for independent software vendors uh, is refactoring. And so this is actually rewriting, decoupling your application, doing the dreaded monolith to microservices dance, uh, all the things that you want to do. And potentially you would do that either as a combination of a lift and shift and then refactor 
or refactor before you actually ever move to the cloud. Um, the other pattern I've seen quite often in refactoring is uh, a hybrid play where potentially all your new features are all built cloud native, but they're talking back to on-prem legacy systems in a hybrid nature until you can refactor them into a multi-tenant app or into some other method. And this is a very common pattern you see in a lot of development shops um, who are you know, typically consumer-facing SaaS applications or business-facing SaaS applications. Uh, a lot of refactoring happens. This is where Jonathan and I live <laughs> in this one. <laughs> Uh, although we live a little bit in lift and shift as well, but uh, you know we both have done a lot of refactoring in our day uh, to get to cloud native, and, and we talk a lot about that here in particular. You know, I think this this goes back to the discovery piece in a way because if you are deploying net new services in the cloud, then you have to make sure that uh, you know latency is acceptable, um, and you can continue to still provide the level of service that you want during the migration. Otherwise, you know, that, that may be a factor in deciding which one of these choices to make. Yeah. I mean, this definitely it goes back to what's the business want? <laughs> and what, are you, what business problem are you truly trying to solve? And then the other thing is, if you're looking at a data center, uh, you know, situation, if you're keeping that data center, you may just decide to not move a thing, which is a definite path, <laughs> or to even just retire and decommission it because maybe you've moved on to different solutions and now it's time to finally deprecate that 30-year-old piece of software you've been carrying on from the mainframe because there's better, newer things that could work better for you. So those are options as well in the migration story. Typically, when you talk about it from a center of excellence perspective, or just any any of the cloud providers talk about it, typically from these, they have different words, uh, but these are the most common ones I think that I've seen. I think I, I think the one that Google uses is lift and improve. <laughs> is move and improve. Them. Move and improve. That's it. Move and improve. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's lots of options there. Um, but that's a that's a pretty good uh, summary of the different ways to think about migration in particular. Um, and again, like picking what's right for your business is all kind of goes back to that discovery phase and what the business need and understanding the value of that app. And, and I will tell you that, you know, if you're selling to your business the need to innovate or the need to do these things and you're going to move on a cloud journey, then you need to actually deliver on those things. Because <laughs> if you're just trying to move to get out of a data center, Maybe that's not a great, great solution because if your desire is to make money, <laughs> this is not a great way to make money uh, if you're going through these, these transformational processes, if you have no intention to continue to innovate. So again, think about your products. Think about what stage of the maturity cycle they are. Are they dying? Are they, are they stable? Are they developing? Or are they incubating? Um, and really make that decision for those apps that make sense for you. You know, I think you also have to look at your existing operational processes if if you run an application which requires that you know the SRE team logs in and tweaks things on a on a constant basis because it's unreliable, or in these configuration changes, or you know perhaps the product doesn't have features that it needs and the ops team has to take care of things which which um, which sort of turn it into a SaaS product and you know, the back office type of things. In the data center, I, I think my experience at least has been that that's been pretty much world wild west and. Lots of people, too many people have access to everything in production and it's acceptable just to log in and do stuff. Uh, I think going back to what we talked about for the CCOE, uh, we, you know, we, want, we don't want that to happen anymore. I think it's an opportunity to define new controls and define new standards and perhaps you need to think about the way your application is managed as well during the discovery phase because you, know, you don't necessarily want people logging into these instances. Maybe they can't even log into instances you know, if, if it's a Lambda function. You can't log into it and fix something. So you need to think about the business processes and, and how they map and how they have to change as you move to cloud as well. 100%. Yeah, the, um, yeah. <laughs> migration is not just move the app. It's so much more transformational <laughs> to it. Uh, and you know, eventually in the series, we'll get to cloud transformation and what that means and, uh, and probably spend a lot of time talking about that. But uh, yeah, that'd be, that'd be a fun conversation in the future. So next week, we're going to talk, we're going to dive deep into hybrid migrations, cloud native migrations, and VMware migrations, and kind of you know drive down some of those dragons we talked about today uh, briefly in more depth, and uh, look forward to talking about that next week. Sounds good. Look forward to it. So actually, I won't talk about it. You guys will talk about it because I'm not here. But uh, That's right. Yeah. So good <laughs> luck to you all. <laughs> uh, good timing. <laughs> yes, excellent timing on my part. All right. We'll have another fantastic week in the cloud, Jonathan. Thanks. You too. Good night. And that is The Week in Cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Foghorn Consulting. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tweet us your feedback at hashtag thecloudpod. Or join our Slack channel, go to our website, thecloudpod.net, for sign-up instructions. Uh, 
uh, well, you know, we talked about uh, three or four weeks ago, we, we mentioned the $35 million or $35 billion investment that uh, Amazon is going to make in Virginia. Do you, yeah. do you recall that? Mm-hmm. So apparently not everyone's happy about that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So apparently if you live next to a data center, you hate this. <laughs> <laughs> so the Washington Post uh, had a great article about the uh, invading data centers of North Virginia, uh, basically, and uh, you know why it's the heart of the internet, not everyone's happy. And so they they went through and talked to a bunch of different people. And there were some interesting takeaways from this article, which I thought would be a good after show topic. Um, so first of all, North Virginia apparently is home to 275 data centers, which started back in AOL days when AOL moved their corporate data centers to there with Equinix, and it became a data center bonanza uh, as it continued to get built out. Uh, apparently it handles at least a third of the world's online use, which makes sense, uh, with dozens of mass structures scattered all across the country of Virginia. Uh, and apparently it has a bit of an arms race, similar to as some governments uh, you know, advocate for getting casinos into their towns or cities. Uh, getting a data center is a pretty lucrative thing. And so a lot of uh, companies, uh, sorry, a lot of governments locally would like to get them. Apparently, though, if you live next to it, in, in this article, there's a photo of a data center right behind these people's houses. <laughs> uh, if you live next to it, amazingly enough, a data center has a hum to it. Because a lot of that AC towers and cooling towers, they have to run 24 by 7 all the time. So there's a constant noise uh, that they all hear. And then, of course, your generators have to be tested on a monthly basis to, for sock reasons. And so these things are firing up, spewing diesel fumes and all kinds of fun uh, in that particular area, uh, which isn't really so great. But, uh, you know, the reason why the governments want it, and this is, this is the thing I was kind of blown away with. So in Ludon, where that photo comes from, there's 115 data centers, and the Ludon municipality makes $576 million in tax revenue <laughs> off those 115 data centers every year. Uh, and apparently, they, and that, I didn't actually understand the economic model of this, but apparently the equipment you put into the data center, you have to pay a tax on. Uh, so it's a very high-paying uh, tax revenue base with very low need for government services because it does not, need a, does not need hospitals, it does not need schools, it does not need medical personnel. It just needs some security people, some power, and some noise uh, to help address that. Uh, so there you go. It's a, it was a fun little article. Other side of the data center investment of $35 billion. Not everyone is as happy about that growth as the government maybe is. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's totally understandable. Those not exactly attractive buildings. <laughs> I mean, they're just warehouses, right? They, oh, yeah. it's a warehouse. Great, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's like the history of the, of why they're there, though. In Ashburn, it goes back to the you know the the beginning of not the beginning of the internet exactly, but the beginning of the commercialized internet. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, May, May East, the Metropolitan Area Exchange, the first massive internet pop, oh. because there's international fiber that the rise in DC and Virginia. And it's it's really sort of the the ingress point to worldwide traffic to the U.S. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it makes total sense that they're there. But yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, every every acre of land that's taken up by data center is not taken up by you know commercial um, commercial businesses, you know stores that people want to go to, uh, you know nice new houses. It's uh, yeah. It's, well, even looking at the map uh, in the article, there like there's a couple data center, you know, massive campuses of data centers right next to like national monuments <laughs> of like you know, may, uh, you know, civil war battles that occurred in Virginia, you know, right behind the data center. You're like, oh, that's that's lovely. <laughs> so, uh, you know, yeah, the, you know, this part of it you don't always think about when uh, thinking about your data center spend and your Amazon or or other uh, Equinix based uh, data center providers out there. So that that was a fun story to share, just because. Uh, yeah, never think about the little people out there getting who have to deal with air conditioning noise twenty four hour twenty four hours a day. Yeah, that's, that's uh, never really thought about that. Yeah, apparently they're pretty loud too because uh, you know in the article, you know they're talking about Prince of Williams, Virginia, uh, has a thirty three year old noise ordinance in which residents uh, have to limit great daytime noise to less than sixty decibels, uh, or what a normal conversation sounds like from about three feet away. Uh, and 55 decibels at night, so a little bit less. Uh, but the ordinance exempts air conditioners, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, of course, all the data center cooling system is an air conditioner, technically, at the end of the day. So it doesn't. So it's got to be louder than 60 decibels, which, you know, again, living right next to a data center uh, is pretty noisy. Did, there was a comment that Amazon's trying to actually fix this issue, and they were talking about changing out uh, some of the fans with different types of blades that are quieter, and, and they are trying to address it and work with the community uh, for those people who live right next to the data center, for goodness sakes. Uh, but uh, yeah, could you imagine building buying this really great house in Virginia, 
you know, the beautiful forest behind it. And then they knock that down and put a data center there. Oh, <laughs> mm. Actually, did you see that uh, new propeller? Um, it, was, it was built by a university. I mean, it was MIT. Instead of being sort of having spokes for blades on the propeller, it, it looks like three, three loops oh, instead. Really? And um, they, they use it for, for drones because they want quieter drones that military use, things like that. You know, kind of sneak up on people with a loud drone. But yeah, I, I imagine that same, that same design could be applied to any kind of um, any kind of propeller system, so maybe they can reduce the noise. I, th- I think it was quite significant too. It's like a third of the a third of the the, uh, the noise as a regular propeller made. Oh wow! I mean, most drones are pretty quiet unless they're right on top of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I mean, like to be a third, you know, a third of the noise of a current drone is pretty impressive. So. Yeah. Well, good. All right. We'll talk to you next week. Yep. See you later. Have a good night. <laughs>